So Jesus, we thank you for this day. We thank you that the battle is yours. We thank you that it's not by might or by power, but it's by your spirit. We thank you that you've got us. You've got us securely. And no matter what trouble the world has to offer, you've given us the ability to, go, to overcome the world. And you've given us the gift of your peace through your spirit. So Lord, may we keep our eyes focused on you instead of the trouble so that we can be those who prevail more than conquerors through Jesus Christ who strengthens us. We ask you to have your way here today. Lord, just enjoy yourself and enjoy us. May we enjoy your presence. And we pray all this in your name, Jesus. Amen. I sure enjoyed all those uh, songs about the name, the name of Jesus. That was sort of what the Lord was talking to me about. And it was just nice to have all that focus. So yesterday was my birthday. <laughs> Thank you. I'm now on Route 66. I don't know if anybody else is. <laughs> so, yeah. Didn't they, didn't they drive a Corvette on Route 66? Yes. I need to get me an old, it's like a 61 vet or something. Need, need to get that for Route 66. Um, my, my granddaughter called me yesterday, yesterday morning. She wanted to talk to me about my gifts. That's a good girl. <laughs> well, yeah, I I absolutely want to talk to you about my birthday gifts. Yes, so uh, what would you like? And she was just asking me what I thought I needed and stuff. And I always suggest things like, um, well, you know, we got that M&M dispenser. It needs some M&Ms in it. And she was like, yes, we do. We need some M&Ms for that. But uh, we talked about some things like that, that that, you know, the kids would benefit from. And then she said, but there needs to be something unexpected. I went, oh, I love you so much. <laughs> yes, yeah, something unexpected. So I got me some birthday gifts yesterday, and they were unexpected. But some were M&Ms for the M&M dispenser. <laughs> and they cr promptly opened them up, put them in the dispenser, and began cranking that arm. And so it was good. Um, but... But we've been looking at gifts, and today the gift of the Holy Spirit in this particular Greek word just means a gift or a present or a gratuity. It's, it's not anything we've earned. It's truly a gift. If somebody gives us a gift, it's not wages. It's not earnings, you know. It's not on a W-2 because it's a gift. They gave us a gift. <laughs> Wasn't anything I could do to get it. They just, somebody loved me and gave me a gift. I love that. And so, um, so today, the gift of the Holy Spirit, truly, what a gift. It's an amazing gift. So um, see how this does. It showed up. <laughs> I was scared to look. See if it, yeah, okay. So uh, Acts 2.38 Y'all do know the, that old joke, right? The old preacher told that joke about the lady having a break-in. And she didn't know what to do, so she just hollered Acts 238. <laughs> and the guy, the, the, the bandit just gave himself up, laid on the floor, put his hands behind his head, and waited for the police to get there. And the police were like, what are you doing? What, what are you doing? And the guy said, well, she said she had, <laughs> she said she had an ax in 238. <laughs> so I'm like, give myself up. That's, that's, see, that, that did better than the joke I was going to tell. So that's, that's good. So, um, so Acts 238, some of you grew up in the Christian churches and churches of Christ. And after John 316 and Jesus wept, well, you sort of know this this passage. 
But Peter's in the middle of his sermon on Pentecost, and he talks about the passage from Joel about how the Holy Spirit will be poured out. That that's what they've seen. You know, it was a rushing mighty wind. There was the the flames. Uh, we call call them tongues of fire. They may have actually been been uh, encapsulated in a flame of fire. We don't know how big the tongue was, but uh, 120 believers. And uh, some people think it was in the upper room. I have a tendency to think it happened at the temple because it says at the end of Luke and also beginning of Acts that they were continually in the temple courts praising God, and this was a feast day. So they should have been at the temple. And where's a better place for the Lord to show up with a rushing mighty wind and flames of fire to announce this new covenant? and uh, this new day. But anyhow, wherever it was, it happened, and 3,000 got baptized that day, which is another reason I thought it was at the temple court because they, they have the capability to baptize that many people because to go up to the temple, you baptized yourself before you went up. You, you washed. And uh, so everybody... Everybody got baptized. How would you like that if we just had a Duncan booth out there? And before you could come in here, you had to go through the Duncan booth. Every time you came in, you had to go through the Duncan booth. You're like, oh, I forgot something. I got to go back. Oh, Duncan booth again. Okay. <laughs> um, but anyhow, he called it the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it's that, it's that word, gift, gratuity, present, that kind of thing. And um, the Lord had told them to go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise. And he had been very clear about what the promise was. And they already had some ideas about the Holy Spirit. The Lord had already talked to them some about the Holy Spirit and who the Holy Spirit was. They didn't have a full understanding. They got to know him better. But, um, you know, there was that one place that Jesus said, hey, it's better for you if I go. Now, can you imagine that? They had spent three and a half years with him, seen amazing things, you know, watched him. I know we say cleanse the leper, but you do realize that lepers literally, they had rotting flesh. Their limbs, it was as if their body was already dead and was rotting, decaying, and Jesus made them whole. And then people who were blind, and he gave sight. People who were deaf, and he gave them their, their uh, audio stuff, stereo stuff, hearing stuff. And, um, you know, raised people from the dead. Remember he walked into Jairus' daughter's room and told him she's just asleep, and everybody mocked him. He got the last laugh, though, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. She was just asleep when the right person knows how to wake you up, right? So they had seen amazing things for three and a half years, just amazing. John says at the end of John, he supposed that if everything had been written down, because only things were written down to show us, to give us a sample, but he supposed if everything was written down that the world could not hold the volumes that could have been written down. Can you imagine just writing moment by moment everything Jesus said and did. So, I want to look, I'll probably use the book of John. Well, I am going to use, I'm not going to probably, I am going to use the book of John to look at who the Holy Spirit was in the New Testament. Uh, it's too much to go all the Gospels, but I'm going to look at John because John's the one that covers the Last Supper where Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit quite a bit. And uh, this isn't everything in John, but this is a sample from John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, of some things with the Holy Spirit to show us this gift that he's promised. So first of all, I'm not going to have you raise your hands, but if you're a believer, which I assume about everybody in here is, then you have the gift of the Holy Spirit. If you're a believer 
and you really want to take time to meditate on this and consider this, it will flip you out. You have the Godhead, not just with you, but in you. The Godhead. Imagine if, if I want to, I'll take it out of your court. Imagine if Danny could maintain that thought that I have the Godhead within me moment by moment what I could be doing if I could stay focused on the Godhead in me. Wow. Talk about untapped potential. Untapped potential. Talk about a gift that you get that's precious and we're not even using the gift. We're taking it for granted. You get a rocket ship for Christmas and say, I'm going to leave it in my room and keep on riding my scooter. <laughs> Why? Why would you want to do that? <laughs> Get one of those, one of the things in, in Star Trek, going to the, what is it, the trans, what is it? Going somewhere? Transporter. transporter, thank you very much. Get a transporter for Christmas and go, no, I think I'll keep on riding my bike. <laughs> It'll only take me 20 minutes to get to school. Why would I want to wait 20 minutes and just get in the transporter and show up in class? That's crazy, right? Crazy. But that's sort of how we do. We continue doing things in our own strength and our own wisdom. When we have the Godhead, and he's ours. You know, it's getting serious now. I stood up. Okay. So uh, here's John chapter 1, verse 32. Then John gave this testimony. So this is John's testimony. And when you hear the word testimony, if you're somebody from the legal background, you think of somebody who's given sworn testimony in the court of law as a witness. And that is sort of the idea here. And his testimony is, I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. Not not just light on him, not just touch him and fly away. I saw the Spirit come down and remain on him. Remain on him. That's a pretty important word. And he goes on to say, and I myself did not know him. Now, now he's, what he means by that, because Jesus was his cousin, so he knew him, Right? But he didn't know for sure that Jesus was the one because he was looking for the one that God told him. So God had already been speaking to John. But the one who sent me, so he's not talking about Zachariah and Elizabeth. He's talking about the Lord sent him and told him that the one he was preparing the way for was the one the man that you'll see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was, uh, you can go through the Old Testament and you'll see the Holy Spirit talked about as coming upon people. And there's even some language at times that sounds like people were filled with the Holy Spirit. But, but typically, the idea is that the Holy Spirit would come on somebody and anoint them for a certain work, like there were skilled artisans in the tabernacle, that the Spirit of the Lord would come on for them to be able to do that kind of craftsmanship, uh, to follow the pattern that Moses had seen. And later, uh, David, what David had seen uh, when Solomon started building the temple. But here it's saying that this man... John will know who the Messiah is that he's preparing the way for because he'll see the Spirit come down and remain on that one, and that one will have the ability to baptize. And just, just so you know what the Greek meaning for baptize is, it means push them under till they bubble. 
right? It's like dyeing cloth and you push things into the water. If you're dyeing something, you get it totally in the water, right? Because you want the whole thing to be dyed. Unless you're doing that tie-dye thing, you know, but anyhow. But anyhow, um, he's the one that'll baptize with the Holy Spirit. Now this, the one that the Spirit remains on will have the ability to totally immerse you, totally... Um, <laughs> overwhelm you, totally encompass you, totally fill you inside and out with the Holy Spirit. That's a new thing. That's a new thing. That's not happened before. And this is, this is the one you're looking for, John. And John says, I've seen, because he saw, he saw the dove come and remain on Jesus, and I testify, this is my sworn testimony, I'm bearing witness that Jesus of Nazareth is the chosen one. And, and if he's the chosen one, it means he has the ability to give and to baptize in the Holy Spirit. Good? Good. This is a, oh, I've got, I don't have to put my glasses on and read my notes. There it is. <laughs> so, uh, this is John chapter 3, verse 32 through 34, which is still John. John's still testifying. So John's testifying, and he's talking about the one who comes from heaven. He's talking about Jesus, the chosen one. And he's basically saying he's coming from heaven, and he's going to tell us what heaven's about. He's going to give us words from heaven, and people are going to refuse to believe his testimony. That's, that's essentially what John is saying. So he says, he testifies to what he's seen and heard in the heavenlies, but no one accepts his testimony. Again, his sworn uh, testimony, his, his uh, witness, what he bears witness to. But whoever has accepted it has certified, I like that word, has certified, has made it official that God is truthful. For the one God has sent speaks the words of God. In fact, the one God sent before he was known as Jesus was known as the word of God. For God gives the spirit without limit. He's saying that this chosen one of God who has the ability to give us the spirit and to baptize us in the spirit, he has that ability because he is God's chosen. He is the living word. And he himself has the Holy Spirit with no measure. There's no cap on it. No limit on it. Good? Good. Okay. Thank you for saying good. I appreciate that. So this is John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. Yet a time is coming. I wanted to just look at something. I wanted to make sure I had it right. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is Spirit and his worshipers must worship in the Spirit and in truth. Um, this, this is Jesus talking with the Samaritan woman at the well. And, and he's saying to her, there's a new day. And, you know, he, he ultimately says to her when she says, we know the Messiah is coming. He says, I'm he, the one you're talking to. I'm he, I'm the Messiah. And so he's saying that we've now entered a place. It's not going to be about worshiping in Samaria or worshiping in Jerusalem, that true worshipers will have to worship in the spirit and in truth. And you don't have to worry about the truth part because the spirit is the spirit of truth, right? It's saying worship in the spirit. In other words, Jesus has come to start a new day. And once he deals with everything at the cross, he's going to give us his spirit. And true worshipers, people who are saved, people who believe in Jesus, will have the ability to worship in the spirit and in the truth of the living God, because God himself is not a man. It says God is a consuming fire. It says he's a spirit, right? 
Jesus has a body. And we could, we could get into some things about the bodies of the Godhead, like the Father's body and the Spirit's body. But Jesus is the one that's a man, right? So true worshipers will worship in the Spirit and in truth. So this Spirit he's going to give us will give us the ability to worship God in a different way. Because in the Old Testament, even when they worshiped through the temple or the tabernacle, it was still at a distance. Because sin still separated them. But Jesus was coming to bring us into a situation where he was going to give us his spirit, which was going to give us access to the Godhead. Right? Okay. And this is John 6. John 6 is an interesting chapter because Jesus starts saying stuff like, in order for you to live, you've got to eat my body and drink my blood, and it freaked people out. And people basically said, this is a hard teaching, and just started leaving, just left. So verses 61 through 63, which I'm older than all of that, but anyhow... Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Offense is a big deal. If you're offended by this, Jesus is basically saying it's going to keep you from getting life. Offense will keep you dead. Offense will kill you. We got to get rid of offense. It doesn't matter who's offended us. We've got to get rid of offense so that we can receive life. He said, does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend? They're going to see it before it's all over with to where he was before. What if you see the Son of Man go back into heaven? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I've spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. So Jesus said, the things that I'm teaching you now will give you life. The difference in what I say to you and what you hear everywhere else is, what you hear everywhere else is either flesh or a mixture of flesh and spirit. But I'm giving you the spirit. Again, he's the spirit of truth and he's the spirit of life. So Jesus says, I'm giving you life here. And now we know on this side of things that when we partake of the cup and the bread that we are eating and drinking life as we remember what he's done for us because he gave us life, right? Do I want to say anything else about that? I don't think so. I think I'll go on. John chapter 7. I love John chapter 7. This is the Feast of Tabernacles. On the last and greatest day of the festival, it's about an eight-day long thing, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, he's up on the Temple Mount, and everybody's in a hush, and a holy hush. They've just had the water libation ceremony, and it's a holy hush as the priest pours the water onto the altar. And it's a holy hush after you've had this festival full of praise and worship and joy and being more undignified than David, you know, all the old guys dancing in the, uh, in the flames of the menorahs that were in the women's court, 75-foot menorahs, if I remember correctly. And it was just called a festival of lights, all this stuff, and it was all about being in the presence of the Lord. But the thing about in the Feast of Tabernacles is they were looking forward to a day. They were remembering when they camped and the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud was with them. But they were looking for a day when there would be no barrier. And Jesus is now in the midst of this festival saying, guess what? I'm dealing with the barrier. Isn't this cool? Stood up and said it loud. Some of you don't like loud. Get ready, get ready, get ready. Because when you go read about heaven, a lot of it's really loud. (laughs) Really, really loud. There's one place where there's quietness in heaven for a half hour. Other than that, it's pretty loud. Pretty, pretty loud. So he says in a really loud voice so everybody can hear, if anyone's thirsty, come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, a scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. 
rivers of living water or rivers of life. And by this he meant, oh, this way. By this he meant the Spirit. So this river, rivers, not one river, rivers of life. When, when, God, when God did everything, there was a place called Aden, North Carolina. Actually, it wasn't North Carolina. But Aden is Eden. Did y'all know that? That Aden, they got some barbecue over there, is, <laughs> is the same word as Eden. But Eden, in the beginning, the spot of his presence, there were rivers that came in and watered. He wants to make a spot of his presence in, in, in me, in us, with rivers of refreshment rivers of life, rivers of life that can overcome the world, okay? So he's saying there's rivers of life, and he means the Holy Spirit, whom those who believe in Jesus were later to receive. So not yet, not at this point, but he's prophesying up to that time the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. So the Spirit's going to be given. Remember, he tells them to go and wait until Jesus ascends and is seated. Although there's a little, there's a little fudging I'll do with that, but that's basically, okay? So now we'll go to the Last Supper. So in John, the Last Supper is several chapters long. Um, chapter 17 is the prayer that Jesus prays after they had sung a hymn or whatever. I don't know exactly if the hymn's later or what, but it's, the, it's, it's his prayer. And in his prayer, he prays for them. He also prays for us, those who will believe on the basis of their testimony. So he prays for us then. And it actually, if I remember correctly, the, the John begins in like chapter 13, so 13 through 16 is all the Last Supper. He may even start in 12. And I think 11 is like, y'all check me on all this because I'm just talking off the top of my head. <laughs> Things can get away. But uh, 11, I think, is where he raises Lazarus. And remember, they wanted to kill Jesus and Lazarus because they couldn't, they couldn't explain Lazarus. But anyhow, we've got a whole lot of stuff he says during that time in the Gospel of John. And some of it's about the Holy Spirit. So this is uh, John chapter 14, verses 16 and 17. He says, I'll ask the Father, and he'll give you another advocate. Advocate, uh, that Greek word there is several different words that can get at that. But advocate by itself would be uh, like a defense attorney in a court of law. Someone who advocates on your behalf, Right? But it's also, it can mean helper. It can mean comforter. It can mean consoler. It can mean, well, I'll just tell you the word. It's, it's paraclete. And it means one who comes up under and supports. The, the Holy Spirit is somebody who's going to come into my life and whatever is going on in my life He's going to support me yes, and help me. Yes. Thank you. And he's willing, but I've got to be willing to let him. Yes. He's there and he's available, but he's not going to take over without me asking him to help, right? Yes. So he said, I'm going to ask the Father, I'm going to ask Abba, and he is going to give you another advocate. Jesus is saying he had been their advocate, so there will be another advocate who will come and help them and be with you forever. So Jesus is saying, I'm about to leave, but I'm going to send you somebody just like me who will never leave. Hey. Never, ever, ever leave. That's why he said it's better for you that I go because this other one who's just like me will come and be with all of you all the time. And however many people I have, 
that you bear fruit. He'll be with all of them all of the time. No one will ever be forsaken. No one will ever be alone. No one will ever be orphaned. Everybody will have the Godhead with them all the time with no separation. No separation. Because I'm dealing with the separation. And he says, this one is the spirit of truth. You know, I mentioned that already. He's the spirit of life. He's the spirit of truth. He does not lie. The Holy Spirit doesn't lie. Jesus doesn't lie. God doesn't lie. They can't lie. They're incapable of lying. Right? Because if they say something, it happens. That's how they do things is they speak. And what they speak takes place. Right? So he's the spirit of truth. He will not deceive you. He's not going to come and dangle a carrot in front of you and laugh while you go chasing it. He's for real. And he's going to be with you. The world can't accept the Holy Spirit because it doesn't see him or know him. But you know him for he lives with you and he will be in you. So he's already saying the Holy Spirit is living with them, but there's coming a day shortly where the Holy Spirit will reside within them. This is at the Last Supper again. Later in that chapter, after I just tripped on my own foot, later in that chapter, verses 26 and 27, he says this, but the advocate, again, the defense attorney, the helper, the one who comes up under to support, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, So the Father's sending him because of what Jesus has done. So he's coming in the name of Jesus because it's all waiting. The Father is waiting to send the Spirit until Jesus has dealt with the separation. He will teach you all things. Check this out. I've got somebody up under me to support me, to help me, to plead my case whether it be in the heavenly court or the earthly court, who is going to comfort me and console me and all that kind of stuff, and he's going to tell me the truth, and he's going to minister life to me, it's already a really good deal. And now Jesus says, guess what else he'll do? He'll teach you all things. I had some teachers that were willing to teach me some things. I didn't listen. And often when I did listen, I was just listening until the test. I just saw a cartoon the other day, and it was like, Uncle, Uncle Seth, on his deathbed, finally announces to, the, to everybody when the doctors tell him he's about to die to just you know, get his things straight with everybody, and all of his loved ones are around. He said, yay, I never used algebra. I'm sure there's a reason for algebra and calculus and trigonometry. Right, Bonnie? Yeah, Bonnie's not here, so. Bonnie's with the kids, yeah, she needs some trig right now. So, um, so anyhow, if I'm willing to listen to him, he's willing to teach me some stuff, a little bit of stuff. It says he'll teach me all things. And he'll remind me, he's better than your mama. He'll remind me, better than your, never mind, I won't say that. Better than your daughters. <laughs> How about that? He'll remind you of everything I've said to you. Jesus is saying that this spirit that he's going to give them has the ability to teach them all things and remind them of everything that Jesus has spoken And I guess that would also include everything that he did, that he would remind them. And he's going to be in them. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. That sounds like peace is associated with the Holy Spirit as well. 
I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. So it sounds like, in addition to all the other stuff, now he has the ability to teach me everything, remind me everything that Jesus has done or spoken, and he can give me peace in the midst of the world that has trouble. He can give me peace in the midst of trouble so that this world does not affect me so that instead I affect the world because the peace in me is greater than the trouble around me. And we're called to be people who can walk into a troubled room and, and peace be still happens. So I should be able to say, I am not going to fear for my mind is fixed or stayed upon the Lord and he will keep me at perfect peace. And now besides that Old Testament scripture, I have the one who ministers peace within me. But all of this depends on Danny wanting it. Danny remembering and Danny calling on. He goes on, still in the, in, the, uh, in the Last Supper. This is the next chapter, chapter 15, verses 26 and 27. When the advocate comes, so he's still talking about the Holy Spirit, whom I'll send you from the Father. He's very clear. He's sending from the Father, the Father sending in his name. It's all about him. The Father are going to give us this third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, so again, the spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. He will bear witness of me. And when he bears witness of me, guess what you're going to want to do? You're going to want to bear witness of me too. Because when you've relied on him and you see him give you victory and you see him come along and help you, that'll make you want to praise me because he's coming as my gift to you to give you a more than conqueror lifestyle. Does that make sense? Yes. So he's going to test, the Holy Spirit comes and testifies about Jesus. And then that's gonna make me want to testify about Jesus as well. And specifically he was saying to them, you've been with me from the beginning of my ministry and everything. You're going to have a testimony. Still, Last Supper, this is chapter 16, verses 13, 14, and 15. But when he, the spirit of truth, again, spirit of truth, he'll guide you. So he's going to be my guide. He's the scout. You know, there was a scout that went out ahead of the cavalry. He said, no, let's don't go in there. It's an ambush. You know? <laughs> or, hey, there's water ahead. A scout who will guide you. Amen. You've never been lost somewhere, have you? Needed a scout. <laughs> Needed a guide. Yeah, yeah, we got one now, right? <laughs> yeah, that one that I got is always reprocessing. What is it? Recalculating. Because <laughs> I missed whatever it told me to do. <laughs> but when he, the spirit of truth, he'll guide you and where is he going to guide you? Into all the truth. Because lies will take you into death. Truth will take you into life. He'll guide you in all truth. So you'll know what you're doing. He'll not speak on his own. Check this out. The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, just like Jesus. But he's not going to speak to me just on his own. When he speaks to me, it's the full counsel of the Godhead. It says he'll speak only what he hears. Is he going to speak only what he hears from the angels? No. He's going to speak what he hears the Father and the Son discussing when he's with them in the council of the Godhead. And then he's going to come back, and if I'm willing to listen, if I'm willing to ask, he'll tell me the council of the Godhead. He'll tell you what's yet to come. Can you prophesy? Yes. Because you have the Holy Spirit in you. The Holy Spirit knows what's coming. Amen. 
<laughs> yes, amen, thank you. <laughs> yes, he does know what's coming. Here's Bobby Connor. Do y'all, how many of you know who Bobby Connor is? Two people, okay, three, okay. So Bobby Connor writes, Bob, Bob Jones went to him years ago before Bob Jones died and said, you're gonna write, I don't know, the shepherd's staff or whatever it is. And it's a thing where, what'd you say, Angie? Shepherd's Rod. Shepherd's Rod. It's a thing that he writes what's coming in the next year prophetically. He's been doing it for 28 years. But Bob Jones came to him and he said, <laughs> Bob Jones said, you're going to write this shepherd's rod. He's like, no, I'm not. That's your thing. It's your thing. I'm not going to. And, and he said he was going to tell him, I don't get stuff like you get stuff. I get different kinds of stuff because we prophesy in part, right? And Bob said, yeah, and walked away. <laughs> like, I didn't told you. I did my part. <laughs> and then he said, Jesus walked up and said, you're going to write the shepherd's rod. He was like, but Lord, I don't get stuff. And he said, boom, just like that. He was ascended, and he was sitting in a place with movie screens going all around him. And every movie screen he looked at, he knew everything in it, everything about it. He could answer any question about it. He went, I guess Jesus can give me the revelation that I need to write the shepherd's run. So he'd been writing it for 28 years. And he writes it on the Day of Atonement, the fall feast. He said 90 days before the fall feast this year, well, it was 2022, when he's getting ready to write about 2023. He said the Holy Spirit came and said, so guess what the shepherd's rod's gonna be about? Do you know? And he was like, he was in the middle of some presentation. And he was like, no, I'm not thinking about that. I don't know what's coming. And the Holy Spirit said, I do. <laughs> The only reason I told you that is because of this scripture. He knows what's coming. And he lives in you. Amen. So, if, is Jessa in here right now? She go out. So if Jessa and Johanna, I won't include justice, I'll just go Jessa and Johanna, are living at my house and I know, I know stuff about what's getting ready to go down. They've got a shot. Hey, Justin. They've got a shot to hear about it because I know and they live in my house with me. Right? I might not tell them, but I might. And if they ask me a question about it, I probably won't lie to them. I'll probably tell them. The Holy Spirit is willing to tell us He's not holding out on us. He wants us to have revelation. Am I willing to sit down and listen? Am I willing to ask? Because I got to learn his voice. Because there's a lot of voices. And a lot of voices are meant to be distractions to distract me from the one voice. But just like I can, I've said this before, I can be in a crowded room and Angie says, Danny, I go, because I recognize her voice, even in the middle of lots of noise, I recognize that familiar voice. I can get so familiar with the Holy Spirit that I can recognize his voice no matter what kind of noise is going on. But that depends on me. He's here. He's here. What does Danny want to do with the gift that Jesus has given me? So it says, he can tell you what's yet to come. He'll glorify me. So the work of the Holy Spirit in me is to glorify Jesus because it's from me that he will receive and he will make known to you. It's going to be in the counsel of Abba and the Son, the Father and the Son, that the Holy Spirit is with them, that he's going to hear the things and he's released by them to tell me, to share it with me. That boggles the mind. Just boggles the mind. Verse 15, Jesus goes on to say, all that belongs to the Father is mine. 
Jesus said, everything belongs to me. Jesus has authority. Yes, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Everything is his and he has all authority. So all that belongs to the Father's mind, that's what I said the Holy Spirit will receive from me and will make known to you because Jesus has it all and he says, these are my people. I've given you as a gift to them. Share what I have with them. How many times did Paul say, I would not have you be ignorant and tell people a revelation? The Holy Spirit, if I'm willing to listen, will often say, I don't want you to be ignorant. Here's the news. So I'm going to end with this one. What time is it? Ah! Football doesn't start till three. But that one during the watch is a problem. But, but anyhow... So this is still before he left because he told them, go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise. And he's talking about the Holy Spirit as the promise. The Holy Spirit is what he has promised to give them. And he's just like him. But this is before he goes. And he shows up one time and he says, peace be with you, which is, is a ministry of the Spirit. That one passage look like, as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. Jesus was an apostle from the Father, and now he's sending out apostles. And with that, he breathed on them. And some of y'all have seen those little posts that I do, and I talked about this in one of those posts. This word in Greek is the word that um, is used in the Septuagint. The Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures. And they chose this Greek word for God breathing into Adam the breath of life. Jesus breathed on them. And he breathed life. And he said, receive the Holy Spirit. You know what receive means in the Greek? Take it. <laughs> take it as yours. Make it your own. Don't let somebody take it away from you. It's yours. Hold on to it. Don't let it go. It sounds all nice. Receive ye the Holy Ghost <laughs> in, the, in the King James. But he's saying, take him. Hold on to him. Don't let him go. He's yours. He's yours. I want to give you life and life abundant. Receive the spirit of life. So, I'm going to stop here. And the praise team can come up, I guess. And um, I just want us to try to, to grasp for a moment the amazing gift that we have. I, I just had a glimpse. In that moment right there, I just had a glimpse of all of us being transformed like on the Mount of Transfiguration. All of us just being transformed, going through a metamorphosis because we were allowing the Spirit to have more control of our lives. And what then took place as a result of that willingness to give my will over to him. Kevin, do I need to move this? I guess I should. I'm going to step down real gingerly now. That didn't look very athletic, but anyhow. <laughs> that would be something. And I just, I just saw it in a moment, and all of you were just lit up like bright light, all of you.
If I had any rhythm, I'd dance right now. I listened to oldie songs yesterday, and an old song, song came on, and she said, dance with me. I said, no. She said, oh, hush. All you do is stand still and let me dance around anyway. So <laughs> just stand there. Come on. Dance. I stood there. She, you know, we're dancing. We're dancing. My, 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 my feet haven't left the place, but we're dancing. So. I appreciate it, too. That was a happy birthday. Thank you. I, have, I don't have the... I'm not capable to describe to you the stuff I feel about this it is so overwhelming to me that we have the Spirit of God abiding. And here's, here's just one thing. Let me just, just one thing. Something happens in our life. We get so focused on that thing and even praying for that thing. But you know what? My prayer is still about that thing instead of my prayer being, oh, Jesus, I thank you that you've dealt with it all. Jesus, thank you that you're an overpayment for everything. Jesus, I thank you that you've dealt with it and you've given me your Holy Spirit, a spirit of life, overcoming life. That's a, that's a very subtle difference. But my prayers can actually make an idol out of the symptom I'm praying about Instead of looking at Jesus, who's the answer, who's already dealt with it, I'm looking at the problem, the trouble that the world has brought. Instead of the one who can give me peace in the midst of the trouble, who's already given me the victory. That's where my eyes need to be. And if I will stay in touch with the Spirit, He'll keep me there. But it's just easy for us to slip into stuff that's way below what we're capable of. I'm going to stop because I'll keep on going to 3 o'clock now if I start busting on that. So um, first of all, is everybody saved? Is everybody saved? Everybody saved? Okay, well, I'm going to pray for communion. When we have communion, if you need to leave, you're free to leave. If you want prayer, the prayer room's right over here. And if you want to stay in worship, they'll keep on worshiping. You're free to stay in here and worship. So here we go. Lord, today I thank you that you dealt with the separation. You dealt with the barrier. You dealt with the great divide, that chasm between us and you. You came and you dealt with that, so there's no longer any separation. And you've brought us into communion with the Father. You've brought us into the throne room. You've seated us with you in heavenly places. And you've given us the Spirit of God, the Spirit of life. And we have access to the counsel of the Godhead. How amazing, Lord. And it's because of what you've done. So, Lord, today we celebrate you and we thank you and we glorify you for your willingness to go to the cross for us. And as we eat this bread, we're mindful of what your body went through in that intercession for us. And we remember the scripture that says, by your stripes we were healed. And we thank you for the blood And how your blood makes us whiter than snow. How you've redeemed us and you've given us life and life abundant. And you've given us eternal life with you. Thank you for the cup and thank you for the bread. And thank you for meeting with us as we eat and drink. Give us revelation, Lord. And we pray all this in the name that's above every name. Because you have authority in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Jesus. Amen. Amen.